Hello and welcome to Inside Healthcare. There's been a spike in ER visits in the Twin Cities metro area lately, and that is resulting in long waiting times to be seen by a doctor. You might be su surprised by what's causing this increase in ER visits. We visit with Dr. Christy Trousseau at the Egan Urgency Room to find out what's causing this increase in emergency visits and how telehealth might be an option for you for your next emergency. Our emergency department and our urgency room is just seeing a really big increase in patient volumes. And, you know, we think that's from a number of different causes. One is there were, there was a time where people were reluctant to or instructed to not access healthcare, delay healthcare. So we're seeing some pent up demand. We're also seeing increase in COVID cases related to the Delta variant. And thirdly, uh, despite the rising COVID cases, there's been more return to some of our more normal activities and people are getting together more and out and about more traveling and doing things that um, that spread our, or also spread our usual viruses and the common cold. And those people are coming in for their symptoms to be tested for COVID and further evaluated. And so the combination of these things has really, really driven up volume. You know, I also noticed two uh, reports and alerts, advisory, I think it was, about um, the increased number of cases of RSV. Um, maybe you can tell us a little bit about what is that and why the increase and, and then if some, what would be the symptoms and someone should be seen by a physician like this. RSV is a virus that causes a respiratory infection. It's called respiratory syncytial virus is the full name. It is most, it can affect, it can infect anyone, but it's most famous for causing infections in younger children. Kind of the uh, baby to age five group tend to be the more symptomatic. Um, the, the virus causes not only nasal congestion and upper respiratory symptoms, but it causes lower respiratory symptoms too, resulting in bad cough, chest congestion, uh, a cough that lingers for quite some time. For the younger children, it causes quite a lot of mucus and inflammation in the chest. And some children get very, very sick from that and have a lot of trouble breathing, breathing some trouble feeding for little babies, and as a result, need to be seen by a medical provider. Uh, some of them need to be hospitalized. This is something that we see every winter, but this summer we're seeing an unusual pattern and time of year for this, for this virus to come out. And it seems like, is that probably because of COVID? Is that the reason why? Or we don't really know why. I, you know, the hypothesis is that there wasn't a period of time in the winter where it was spread around and people gained immunity where, and now as we've returned to more of our usual activities, there's more of just general, you know, sharing of germs and virus. And so we see this, this spike in, you know, kids who probably in a normal year would have gotten this infection last winter and now have it over the summer. So if um, your child has some of these symptoms that you were just talking about, when should they be brought in to see a physician like yourself, emergency physician? So, you know, RSV causes fever, cough, congestion. Um, the main thing that we look for is trouble breathing. So if if the child is breathing really fast or it's or the child seems to be working really hard to breathe, those are the biggest red flags for us. Certainly, if your child has uh, you know a child less than six months should be seen for pretty quickly for any fever. Um, older children, if they have fever that persists for two or three days, they're complaining of ear pain. It's common to get ear infections along with RSV. It's, um, so, but the main thing that the main thing that we look for with RSV is really that trouble breathing. Good, good advice for parents out there. So, and then also, what about how can you tell like if um, it is COVID or another serious infection, and that you should be seen? Well. <laughs> The tricky thing with COVID is that you know, a lot of people have more of the mild symptoms that do overlap a lot with some of our you know, common respiratory illnesses. So really the only way to tell, to differentiate between 
COVID and your other common upper respiratory cough congestion is to get a COVID test, which I think is driving a lot of our demand. And um, people have gotten the message that it's important to get it's important to get tested. It's important to differentiate that from other illnesses. Um, people have really gotten that message. Um, the as far as more serious COVID symptoms, it's chest pain, trouble breathing, um, and that you know the small number of people who do get very very sick have heart and lung problems and related to the a, a, the COVID moving in and causing a, a bad pneumonia in the chest. So would the online or telehealth um, care be an option for these tests and, and for other concerns that people might have? Absolutely. The urgency room has recently launched its telehealth program. Um, initially, we only offered COVID testing. Now we offer a wider variety of testing. Telehealth is a great way to get a COVID test, but not only have a COVID test, but also talk with one of our providers about your symptoms and determine if there's something else going on that you maybe need an additional test for. Maybe you need to be seen in person uh, to have a chest x-ray if you're if there's something about your your symptoms that you know raises a red flag that this might be more than just you know a a, a, a quick a need for a quick test. Um, so, but uh, for routine COVID testing, our our telehealth platform works really well. Um, it also provides the additional benefit of talking with one of our emergency providers and getting a little bit more of that that uh, specific consultation rather than rather than just the test result. And they can go to your website to um, absolutely get an appointment yep. and get that scheduled. Urgencyroom.com. That's where we launch our telehealth from. You know, I know how busy you are, so we really appreciate your time. So thank you and great advice for everyone. Thank, thank you. you for having me. Thanks. When times get dark. We can't see the help that's all around us. Let 211 be your guiding light for help with food, health care, and other resources. 211, how can I help you? Call 211 or visit 211.org. 211, get connected, get help. Welcome back to Inside Healthcare. We thought you might like to know about a program that optimizes well-being for people as they age. It's called Trellis, and they have an upcoming statewide summit called Dementia Friendly Communities. To tell us all about it, we're pleased to have with us Amanda Biggis, a community outreach specialist with Trellis. So thank you for being with us. It's the first time on the show, so thank you. Yeah, thank you so much for having me today. First question, what is Trellis all about, and what, what kind of programs do you provide? Yeah. Trellis is a nonprofit organization, and we serve older adults and caregivers with programs and services uh, that help people age well, basically. Uh, so we are the area agency on aging for the seven county metro area. And as you said, our main goal is to help people optimize well-being as they age. So um, what that means, um, you know, is basically just providing resources and support for people in the community. And we do that a um, variety of different ways. So we have many different programs. And one of those programs is the Senior Linkage Line. I've and heard of it. Yes, yeah, I'm glad you have, yes. Yeah. Um, the Senior Linkage Line is a statewide service of the Minnesota Board on Aging. And it's a free information and assistance line. So um, older adults, uh, family, caregivers, anybody can call the Senior Linkage Line. Um, I get the question very often, how old do you have to be to call the Senior Linkage Line? I was going to ask you that question, yeah. <laughs> um, and, you know, there's no age limit. So anybody can call the Senior Linkage Line, uh, whether you're calling uh, for yourself or on behalf of a parent or a grandparent. Uh, we sometimes even have organizations that uh, call on behalf of somebody that they serve in the community. Uh, so it's an uh, information line, and our specialists on the line are available Monday through Friday. Uh, 8 a.m. to 4.30 p.m. to answer questions or uh, give resources on so all things. Oh, I was going to ask yeah. what kinds of things, yeah. Yeah, so all things related to aging, um, Medicare help, uh, financial assistance, transportation options, um, housing assistance, um, 
you know, caregiver support. So, uh, you know, if you're somebody who's taking care of a loved one, you can call the senior linkage line uh, if you're looking for respite or a support group. Uh, so, uh, basically, all things related to aging. Um, and I think last year, in 2020, we had almost 100,000 uh, points of contact with older wow. adults and caregivers through the senior linkage line. Wow. So it, it really is a great That's really a great good program. community service in that. Yeah, yeah. So, and then I had mentioned also that you have an upcoming a summit on dementia-friendly communities. Yes, yeah, so that's through our Act on Alzheimer's program. Uh, and through the Act on Alzheimer's program, we enable people in their community to become more dementia friendly. Um, so basically, you know, we know that people with dementia can have a high quality of life, but we need to do the work in the community to make sure that, um, you know, our dental offices, our airports, um, you know, the bank, the grocery stores, those places are dementia friendly. Be able to identify signs of dementia um, and know how to communicate with somebody uh, to help them have a good experience and, and thrive in their community. Well, what um, would those kinds of things be? Like, let's say, um, you know, you have an aging parent. I mean, how can you tell that um, maybe they're slowing down a little bit, but how can you tell, like, if there's um, a dementia thing that needs, you know, how to make it friendly, how to, mm -hmm. so that they don't, um, get agitated and things like that if they're out about, yeah. Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, you know, there's a lot of things that are a part of normal aging, um, but when we see things that aren't quite typical of normal aging, that's when, uh, you know, we'd recommend uh, going to see a doctor. You know, maybe a part of normal aging would be, you know, you forget where you put your keys. We all forget where we put our keys. <laughs> but eventually, we can kind of backtrack and find where we put those keys. Uh, with with dementia or Alzheimer's, um, you know it's forgetting things like um, you know you're you're driving to your house and you forget where you live, um, you wow. know, or you forget that um, you had an appointment with a friend and the friend comes to pick you up and and they say what are you doing here? Uh, so it's things like that that aren't um, a normal part of aging that you want to look into. Um, dementia. So what type of help is available through the organizations and that to someone that may be facing something like that? Yeah, well, through our Act on Alzheimer's program we do have Dementia Friends Minnesota which is an information session that anybody in Min Minnesota can attend. Um, and then uh, as you mentioned we do have the statewide summit coming up mm -hmm. on October 7th. Um, and that's going to shine a light on all of the really great work that's been done to make Minnesota more dementia friendly uh, over the past year, despite the challenges of the pandemic. Um, it's been very difficult. I, I can imagine. Yeah. yeah. It's been difficult for anyone, but especially for someone with dementia. Absolutely. Yeah. So, you know, we're, we're really just, um, you know, we're going to be talking about new initiatives. Um, like I mentioned, the, the dental offices, there's training being done from the uh, front desk staff to the hygienist to the dentist all to make that experience much more dementia friendly um, so kind of these really invasive um, you know, scary experiences for somebody with dementia turning in, into a positive experience for them and, and you said this is a free statewide summit and it'll yes. be virtual yes it is and a anyone virtual, can participate anyone can participate yes so um, caregivers professionals um, students uh, and you can register on our website, trellisconnects.org. Um, and uh, that's on our homepage of the website. It's right there to find out more information and to register. And um, it really is for anyone. Yes, yeah, yeah, anybody can attend. And again, the date and the time? It's October 7th. Um, I believe it's a, an all day uh, event. It might start at 9 a.m., but not quite sure on that time. But October 7th is the date. So why is it important to have trellis? I mean, in our you know, in our state and stuff like, what is it all about? Why do we need that? Yeah, well, trellis is an innovator and thought leader in the field of aging. You know, we are striving to meet challenges and opportunities um, of an aging population, and you know, we're doing this through partnerships and through programs, and you know, we know that people age 65 and older uh, are. The population is growing at a, a pretty rapid rate. Um, you know, there's 890,000 
Minnesotans who are 65 and older. Are they really? Yes. And 70% of that population is in the Twin Cities metro area. So, you know, as you can imagine, you know, that number is, is quickly surpassing school age children. You know, it always was, you know, the population of school age children was our largest population. Mm -hmm. And now, you know, that, um, that group, 65 and older, is growing. And understandably, I have no idea. Yeah. yeah, it's, it's putting a, a strain on aging services, um, you know, the resources and supports of aging services. Um, and Trellis is, is really striving to bridge that gap between health care and social care. Um, you know, we know that aging is not a one-size-fits-all solution. Mm -hmm. You know, there's many different things that, um, you know, somebody can define as aging well. Uh, one thing that works for somebody might not work for somebody else. Um, so we know that, um, you know, things like access to good health care, being able to pay rent, having food available, those are all very important things. Uh, but we also know that things like um, social connectedness and life enrichment activities, those are also very important. Absolutely, yes. I, I really noticed that, especially during COVID. We are just about out of time. Quickly, if someone wants more information about Trellis, about the summit, again, how could they get that information? Yeah, they can um, contact us at our website, trellisconnects.org. That's where you can register for that uh, community summit. And then, um, you know, all things, all questions related to aging, I always bring it back to the senior linkage line. So call the senior linkage line. That number is 800-333-2433. Well, Amanda, a pleasure to have you on the show and great Good. information. Thank, Thank you, you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you. We'll be back with more right after this. Last week, Brandon met a girl on a dating app. One day after work, he finally found the courage to ask her out. No answer. He started to panic. Was he being too pushy? Maybe it was too... Hey, sorry I didn't respond. I was driving. I would love to go on a date. How does tonight sound? Brandon tried to play it cool, but inside he knew. A girl so smart, so responsible. She must be a keeper. September is Mental Health Awareness Month. According to the Kaiser Family Foundation report, more and more of us are struggling with symptoms of anxiety or depression, especially since COVID. Paul Thomas, who goes by PT, believes that talking about mental health is the first step in reducing the stigma of it. And that's why he's created a nonprofit organization, Living Foundation, to promote a positive outlook on life, to reduce the stigma associated with depression and mental illness, and to prevent suicides. His message is a personal one from his heart. We talk with him by Zoom. It's very personal to me. Um, I lost my father to suicide in uh, 2013 and uh, subsequently, you know, went through kind of a tough time myself, to be really honest, in, in really the year or two after that time period and still continues to this day. And so in, in 2015, we founded this organization called the Living Foundation really to to hopefully open up and start more conversations about mental health and about mental illness, because I think that we still see those that stigma associated with it quite a bit. And I think that's where we're just trying to really reduce that and, and change that narrative. You know, it seemed like, especially during the Olympics with some of the athletes coming out about their mental health challenges, that that was bringing a lot of awareness to the issue in a big way. And did you see that as well, that that was opening up some of that dialogue, getting people talking about it. Yeah, like absolutely. I mean, whenever you're going to have somebody in a, you know, a world stage like that, right, with like Simone Biles, and we have this idea that, you know, that these, you know, celebrities or athletes or whomever it is, like that they are, you know, perfect or infallible in some capacity. And all of a sudden, when they say, hey, you know, I'm not well. And we kind of look at it, what do you mean you're not well? Like it, it makes us think, I think it makes everybody think. And so I think you're absolutely right. I think it brought a lot of light to, you know, mental illness and just mental health challenges in general. And, and I think our hope is maybe with, with living that those conversations can take place not only on the big stage with, you know, the Olympics or whatever, but hopefully that those conversations can then, you know, kind of permeate into our everyday lives a little bit, right? And, and we've kind of joked internally that, you know, what if we could talk about 
mental health, at, you know, the same way we talk about the weather, you know, you and I can get in an elevator with each other and, you know, we can talk about the weather for a couple minutes or five minutes or whatever, but yet we can't talk to our, you know, the people that are the closest to us about, you know, how we're feeling, you know, mentally or, or if we're struggling with things like that just seems, you know, it seems off. So I think we're trying to change that narrative. You know, and I think a lot of people, they feel like if they bring it up, that that could, um, you know, maybe um, bring someone to suicide or make their depression worse. But you're saying that it's important, the first step in um, preventing or reducing that stigma is to talk about it. I, I, th I think so. Yeah, I mean... By all means, you know, I always say that, you know, I'm not really officially a therapist. I'm just someone that has gone through, you know, my own level of trauma. But I think in general, the more that we as people and as humans can, you know, find a safe place and can confide in others, you know, whether it's a friend or a family member or even a, a, a stranger or a therapist or whatever, I think the more that we can open up about, you know, our, our feelings and, and maybe what we're struggling with internally, I think generally speaking, the better off we're going to be. You know, I had one, somebody, you know, one time talk about depression, where like, if you personified depression, specifically that depression would love, you know, isolation, and you know, keeping things silent, and really like the idea that you're not sharing these things with others. And so if you can flip that, specifically with depression, I think if you can have those conversations and be more comfortable about it, I think you're going to be, you know, miles ahead of hopefully preventing, you know, issues or even future suicides. Tell us a little bit about the, the, your foundation, the um, Living Foundation, and what what made you decide to to create the foundation in the first place. Yeah, it started because, um, as I mentioned, when I struggled with the loss of my dad, you know, I, I had a lot of bottled up emotions, and I think I was trying to be you know, maybe strong because I thought that that's what, you know, society needed from me or that's what my family needed from me or whatever. And I'll never forget, I had an opportunity um, as a radio personality to talk about my situation and how I lost my dad and how subsequently that had sort of changed my outlook and my perspective. And we happened to be at an event a little bit later on where a gentleman came up to me and said, you know, I just want to thank you for opening up about mental illness and about losing someone to suicide because it turns out that he had lost his niece uh, previous that year. And he said that it gave him some strength and maybe some comfort that he wasn't alone in sort of his struggles and, and, and the things he was dealing with in terms of the loss of his niece. And so it was kind of right then and there that I realized that if we could create a movement, right, this idea that maybe I'm not comfortable you know, wearing a shirt that says, you know, I lost my father to suicide or that I've struggled with depression or that I, that I've dealt with PTSD or whatever. But if I could wear a shirt or have a bracelet that has, you know, living on it and other people could sort of, you know, come to this, this community as a whole, that we could build a movement and we could bring people together, um, you know, in, with a community that we don't normally talk about. And you ultimately don't have to go that far to find somebody that has struggled mm -hmm. themselves personally, or, you know, that, that has dealt with somebody in their life that has struggled, or maybe they've lost someone to suicide. And that's an unfortunate thing. But I think if we can be more comfortable opening up about that, and maybe even make building those connections, I think our hope is that we'll be able to find people and prevent uh, where someone maybe would have been traveling down the wrong path. And maybe we can sort of bring them back um, to more of an element where they maybe will open up and talk to somebody and get some help that they need. So as a result of your foundation, you also have a weekend retreat for certain individuals that have lost someone to suicide. Tell us about that. Yep. So we, we call it Camp Living. And what it is, is the idea behind it is, I think with my family specifically, and a lot of families that I've talked to, when you lose someone to suicide, there are obviously a lot of broken pieces like there would be with any loss, but it's a little bit different in that there's kind of this perceived choice. And there's like a lot of struggles, I think, internally as a family, there's maybe some guilt, there's sadness, frustration, there's just a lot of emotions. And so we kind of thought like, what if we could create an environment sort of a 
a weekend retreat, if you will, where families that have all kind of been through that same struggle could maybe you know, connect with each other and ultimately also disconnect with the rest of the world and hopefully reconnect with their family, you know, through therapeutic activities, but maybe not necessarily therapy. I think therapy is really, really strong and good, but unfortunately, even therapy as a whole, I think a lot of people are either tentative or they're, they're nervous about it or they're anxious in those, in those spaces. But what if we could create just, again, a safe environment where people could come and they could maybe participate in activities that are therapeutic in nature and, and hopefully get some healing and, and maybe find some peace with, with each other and with their situation? By no means is it going to you know, I bring somebody from a loss back and, and certainly, you know, you're never going to have to be able to change the past, but maybe if you can sort of change the narrative of what the future looks like, I think that's what we're hoping to do. So we call it Camp Living. Uh, right now it's an annual event and we really hope that we can uh, make it ultimately multiple uh, times, maybe a a um, couple times a year, maybe even bring some different types of people together, whether it's a spouse only retreat, or maybe like a kids only retreat or whatever, depending on their loss. Nice. That sounds wonderful. And then you also have your music festival. You're going to have a third one coming up here this month. Yeah, awesome. yeah, we do. Yeah, we've got uh, something that we call the Living Music Festival. So again, kind of this idea that, you know, a lot of organizations have fundraisers that are golf events or 5Ks or, or walks and everything like that. And, and that's perfectly fine. I just think that we, um, number one, with me being kind of in the radio and like music business, like that was kind of my opportunity to maybe to carve out something for, for our organization. But also live in, I think, is we try to do things in sort of an innovative and unconventional way. And so by putting together this, this music festival, it again brings people together that have been you know, affected by mental illness or, or um, you know, suicide in some capacity. And again, kind of gives them that safe space, that safe environment, while they're also doing things that we all want to do in the first place, right? There's a, a barbecue rib and chicken eating contest. That's a lot of fun for people. There's a, a cornhole bags tournament. There's some activities in the morning on Saturday with yoga, meditation. Um, you know, there's some coffee and conversations. There's camping there and of course music. And so you just get food and beverages and people and camping and campfires. And you hopefully bring people together and allow them to embrace life in a positive way while still reflecting and remembering those um, that brought us to the event in the first place. And you have some big um, performers coming? Yeah, so um, it's 10 bands total over three stages headlined by Eddie Montgomery of Montgomery Gentry. Um, you know, and the interesting thing about that scenario is, you know, Eddie Montgomery, it wasn't uh, a suicide, but he lost Troy Gentry, his duo partner, in a very tragic helicopter crash. And so, you know, even though the loss is maybe a little bit different, because it's still a tragic loss. And so, you know, I think we all as a family and as a living family can embrace those situations and what that trauma, like ultimately how that affects us, you know what I mean? And so I think that we're excited to have Eddie there. He's a great performer and then Chris Cruzy from The Voice and a bunch of other uh, local and regional talent from really all over the, the upper Midwest and even coming in from Nashville. Yeah, and I would think especially after COVID, people are ready to get out and shoot. Oh, yeah, yeah, they are. <laughs> Celebrate. Yeah, I think there's life. an element of, uh, yes. yeah, we're, we're all, you know, kind of itching to, to get out there. And it's an outdoors event. So I think we're, we're able to exist in that landscape where we can, you know, spread out uh, plenty if we need to. The facility that it takes place at is ERX Motor Park, which is uh, in Elk River off of 169. They've got over 400 acres there, so plenty of space there to, to spread out and people feeling comfortable, uh, you know, whatever their situation is as it pertains to uh, health and wellness. So we're we're just excited about it. And yeah, we're it's uh, September 17th and 18th, and we couldn't be more uh, more. <laughs> has to get to get back out there and make it happen. Thank you. It's been a pleasure to have you on Inside Healthcare. Thank you so much. That is our program for you. Join us next time on Inside Healthcare. We'll see you then. Stay safe, everyone.